It's time for the unofficial 40. Soonerscoop.com's very official recruiting podcast featuring Soonerscoop.com recruiting publisher, Josh McQuistian. Get your recruiting fix from the leader in Sooner Recruiting. It's the unofficial 40 with your hosts, Soonerscoop.com publishers, Gary Murdoch and Josh McQuistian. We are back once again. It is a uh, another edition of the Unofficial Forty, uh, brought to you uh, by all the good folks at SoonerScoop.com. Josh McQuistion joining us from his studio uh, at home. Eddie Radosovich, Joe Duvall here in studio, and obviously uh, National Signing Day on its way. Uh, we sit here on uh, January 18th. We're exactly two weeks away from National Signing Day. This time at 12:56, uh, as we are recording right now. Should have a lot of answers, or at least... Uh, l- l- let me ask you this, Josh. Uh, of the guys that are announcing, Marvin Wilson, obviously, uh, does he have a time set for National Signing Day at this point? Do we have a Josh McQuistion? Damn that mute button. Anyway, yes, Marvin Wilson, I'm sure will announce on ESPN... But because of that, I don't know that they've set those times yet. That usually is kind of something they do over the last week to 10 days. All right. So uh, I would assume, do we just want to go ahead and get right into Mr. Phillips at this point? Or do we want to? We want to. Yeah. Why bury the lead? I would like to give it up to myself for predicting that there would be no uh, winter weather in Oklahoma City in the last podcast. And I hit that dead on. Yeah. Nailed it. Just absolutely doing people's you are jobs the, for themselves. The head of the truthers, the head of the truther moment as we know it for right now, Eddie Radosovich. Great forecast, Mike Morgan. Great forecast. It wasn't just Mike Morgan. It was David Payne. He's the leader of the pack, though. So uh, I think they all suck. So which one has the bedazzled tie? That would be, Mike, be Mike Morgan. Morgan. Eddie Radosovich. You can't, you can't. Has has it gone down? You know, I left and Gary England was still in the game. Has it fallen off since Gary England, or is it oh. just? It's gotten more. It's gotten more. Uh, how would you describe it? Uh, video clickbaity, sensationalist, yeah. sensational. Yeah. In fact, it's gotten so bad that uh, Gary England actually was taking shots at David Payne on he was, Twitter wasn't over he? the weekend, and it was awesome. He's the leader of men. One of my the best times was when <laughs> Gary England was still there, and he was kind of on the way out, and they were trying to deal with that transition. And you could tell Gary England wasn't having it, and they would try to do that touchscreen board, and England didn't know what the hell he was doing, and he didn't yeah, care. Yeah, he was he was he was ready to get the hell out of there. Yeah, he didn't care. There were there were new times coming, and it's so we survived Ice twenty seventeen at least so far. Uh, a little bit of rain coming up this week, but nothing too troubling. Uh, Obviously, Eddie actually looked at the weather in Baton Rouge this weekend just to see if, yeah. if you know, flaming hail might be befalling the fine citizens of Baton Rouge. I hopefully uh, I'm going to send out a recommendation if Jacob Phillips is listening to this podcast. Try the Chili's in Alexandria, uh, Louisiana. That that place is fantastic. <laughs> That'll make your trip worthwhile. They might and long. They might give you a couple gift cards if you stay around for long enough. You have and to some free cheese. Fries. Yeah, you have to surpass the hour and fifteen minutes before you get the free <laughs> gift card. But it's uh, it's definitely worth it. And I still haven't responded to Chili's yet. Uh, they've been By sliding Twitter. in my DMs, so I need to. Uh, they really went the the whole DM route, huh? Yeah, and I think I'm I'm gonna let it go for another week, and then I'm gonna send them a list of demands. I and, found out something horrible the other day. We were looking this up on the radio because you know I do a radio show with Phil and Zingu had a heart attack. Uh, this year, and so we've we've threatened to kill him by bringing really bad food to the studio, just if he doesn't stop bothering us. The <laughs> bloomin' onion is number one by far mm-hmm. of the worst foods you can eat. Really, number two is one of my favorite things on this planet, and the only reason I go to Chili's, the bacon ranch quesadillas. They're really bad. For they're you. the they're the second worst. Really, anything with bacon and ranch in the name. I could see why a blooming onion would be really bad for you, but that's yeah, surprising. The blooming onion is an in- entire deep fried at least, onion. At least yeah. it's an onion, though, right? They don't deep fry the bacon ranch quesadillas. That's surprising. It's surprising. I like them so much too. Well, if I ever get back to Chili's, maybe I'll have one. But 
Maybe I'll try a to. maybe I'll try a to go Chili's to go to see if yeah. I can get back on that horse. That will be part of my uh, list of demands is that they uh, rename the to go center on and the see, expressway. And see, I really I wish we hadn't been so pissed off that we gave away the gift cards because that was was that forty bucks we had in Chili's bucks. I thought there was just ten dollars each. Okay, which was even more of a slap in the face because what can you buy at Chili's for ten dollars? I'm so glad that we decided not to mention who the restaurant was when we left there. The what? I'm glad we decided not to mention who the restaurant was, so we didn't besmirch them. Oh, I I went after them. What's what's your deal with tipping when you get really really bad? I mean, awful service. I gave service him three dollars. Like oh, that's not bad. Because you can't just leave it blank, because then they might think that you do that all the time. You kind of have to give them the signal. If you leave it blank, he will fill it in with like 20. Well, that's what I'm saying. You can't leave it zero. That's why you make it, make it a penny or whatever. Just I've let put, them know. I've put zero, zero on a I've yeah, never check tipped zero. Never. I've done a penny before. I can't do that to somebody. That guy that served us wasn't a human. I don't. I, he, he, does, he actually didn't even deserve to look me in the eye when he brought me my food. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he did. I think the manager brought our food. That's true. He was already afraid of us. That's true. All right. So uh, I get uh, it's getting to that point where I'm getting a lot of texts about it from like people who listen even just to the radio show about Jacob Phillips. <laughs> uh, it's reached. Is this officially the height of recruiting season, Josh? Where the Jacob Phillips story now is getting so insane that nothing else can surpass this leading up to February 1st. I think that's probably the case because, I mean, you look at the other storylines and really aside from Marvin Wilson, who Oklahoma probably doesn't have a great shot at what, what moves the needle. And then you, you have the storyline of Jacob Phillips becoming a five star on rivals earlier this week, which only magnifies the story, makes an even bigger deal. And now he heads to LSU this weekend. I, I think it's going to be the story people follow all along. What I'm really interested to see is after this visit, does Jacob say something? I mean, does he say, okay, you know, I'm no, I'm going to flip to LSU, or I'm sticking with OU, or I'm still thinking about things? I mean, does he does drag he this hiding? all the way to signing day, or does this just does he end it? Uh, here's my thought, and I was thinking about this driving back from the the station this morning. I think if it's a bad visit. He goes ahead and reaffirms his commitment to OU and says that he's no longer considering any other teams. That's my guess. I mean, I've only met the kid one time, met his family, and I just get the feeling that that's what will happen if it's not a great visit. I get the feeling, though, that he he just wants everybody to kind of be happy with him, and the hardest thing for Jacob will be to tell anybody no. So I think if he can get through that visit through that weekend un, uh, still committed to Oklahoma or just not committed to LSU I think that's a win for Oklahoma because once you get him he off, is such a nice kid he, too. He'll, he'll be nice to those LSU coaches I mean because I mean he's going down there for a reason he's going to want to see it he's going to be a nice kid and he's going to enjoy himself I, I feel like unless something horrible happens the key is getting him out of there uh, without him switching his commitment to LSU and if I, th- I think if that happens Oklahoma is basically in the clear because the easy thing to do at that point is just to call LSU and say, hey, I appreciate your interest, but I'm just going to stick it out. The hard thing to do would be to have to call Oklahoma afterwards and try to deal through that whole decommitment process. So if he can get out of there uh, from switching his commitment to LSU, I think Oklahoma has to feel good. Who's connected to my hotspot on my phone? That's what I want to know. I don't even know how to do that. What is that? Oh, it was my computer. No. Oh. <laughs> You, you are. My computer is stealing my own data. Congratulations. That's messed up. You played computer. yourself. Uh, <laughs> here, okay, Josh, I want to throw this out there and I want you to kind of address this. I, this is one of the great things about kind of the power of rivals. You know, Woody Womack has done a really good job kind of keeping people up to date. I know you and Woody have a dialogue. When, I, when we were in Atlanta, just talking to Woody for, you know, an hour, it's amazing kind of the, the connections that he has. Uh, Josh, I'm kind of wondering. I I was the one that threw out the LSU uh, media kind of stoking the fires in this thing a little bit. But I think one of the interesting aspects of all this, and I don't know how much you want to talk about this, but you know, Jacob has connections to kind of a, a training group. Is that how you would? Is that the best way to identify them or talk about them? Well, the way I always hear it discussed is a singular guy that Jacob pretty much works with, but I do think he is part of a larger group. And if I if I understand the And they were there from, at his announcement and everything, and we got to yeah. meet him and talk to him and stuff. Yeah. 
if I understand it correctly, the, the the primary guy that I don't know if that's you know his primary trainer or just the guy he deals with the most. It, I, I always hear about one guy, and if I understand things correctly, he has either played with or worked for someone that's on the LSU staff, and the name's going to escape me. I'd throw it out there, and I'd end up being wrong. But there is a connection there. Although everything, excuse me, everything I've heard, and you mentioned talking to Woody and talking to some other people, that's not really um, where they think this is coming from. This doesn't feel like a, a you know, a necessary like you know one of these SEC SEC situations that we always talk about. This feels like I think it feels a little Addison Gums ish, like it, and not from the perspective of it's not real but because it's someone close to jacob that kind of wants jacob to take a look at one more school well, thinks and, that may thinks that maybe you should and the reason i bring that up to you is i wanted your thoughts like could this be a situation where uh jacob wants to do you know a solid for his coach and the fact that he wants his coach and his clients and future clients to maintain a good relationship with lsu so because he just seems like the kind of kid like Okay, there's going to be guys that come before me. They're, they came before me. Are going to come after me. I want to make sure everybody has an opportunity to be looked at by other teams, to have good relationships with other teams. Uh, and it seems like LSU is someone that would continually come back to that pipeline that he's coming out of. Does that make sense? It does, and I think there is some validity in that because, and I, you know, we'll cover some of this in the scoop this week. But something that's very interesting to me is, and you know, and I say this is a completely not humble brag, I think I'm the only guy that's had a full interview with Jacob this week, I, or really since the Army game. Um, he and I talk a lot. You know, He's very open to me. We talk about a lot of different stuff. And when I talked to him on the phone the other night, when he talked about OU, man, he was excited and very upbeat, and it just sound, you know, everything sounded like it should sound. I've talked for years about you know a guy saying, oh, yeah, I'm sticking with OU, and I can hear in the way they're saying it, it doesn't sound right. With Jacob, everything checks. Everything sounds like it should sound. He's talking to all the you know the commitments. Everything matches up. When I ask him about LSU, he kind of clams up and he just it doesn't sound like it doesn't sound like something he's excited about. Like it, it sounds like kind of like what you're saying, like almost an obligatory thing. And I can't help but wonder whether, like I said, whether it's his trainer, like you're mentioning, or whether it's something else. I feel like it's something he feels like he has to do. And then when he comes out the other side of it, it, it I, like I said, maybe LSU blows him away. But based on just talking to the kid, I don't get that feeling. I don't get the feeling that he really wants to change his mind. So let me ask you this. Could it maybe be that he doesn't have a bad visit but he, he's doing this a little bit out of obligation, and once he gets back, he can finally say, okay, I gave LSU a look. I'm still going to OU. I, to me, if you made me guess, that's what will happen. I mean, you know, you're talking about a kid that had a ton of offers, all these opportunities, and he had more schools coming on him about the time that he announced for Oklahoma. He could have run this out to this point if he'd have wanted to. He didn't want to. He wanted to be done with it. He took his five official visits literally the first five weekends that he could take official yep. visits. This isn't a kid that runs this circus. I know people won't believe me because, oh, he's committed now. He's looking around. And that makes him a bad kid or something like that. That's, that's just – you don't know the kid. If you've been around him, he's a good kid. He's from a good family. Like There's just – he's doing this either – out of obligation or because he legitimately has some interest in LSU, which I think he does. I don't think this is, you know, his feet being held to the fire or anything. He wants to check out LSU again, but I just don't get the feeling that if it was just him making this decision that he would probably go down and take this trip. So I, I think, I really think he'll be done with this before signing day. But if it, to me, the longer it goes past this visit, probably the worse it is for Oklahoma. Is it just me or does Josh seem a little cocky right now? Yep. Maybe a little yeah. bit. Maybe, maybe kind of like this. Uh, Josh, <coughs> let me let me play something here. Ah! I am a strong man. Take a run at me. <laughs> I just I feel like Josh feels like he's on top of this, and he, and he's got this. There's there's nobody that I would trust more in this uh, than than Mr. Josh McQueen. He's been all over it. Absolutely, hundred percent. Josh, it, it just it 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 strikes me as weird that. There's been so much talk, and even when you talk to the guys that are in the 2017 class, 
How much has it helped with guys like uh, Levi Draper, uh, Creed Humphrey, those guys that are now already on campus that are still talking to uh, to Jacob Phillips? And I mean, I, I think that there's some kind of line there that can be drawn between the two, can't there, after the relationships that they built uh, down in San Antonio over the last couple weeks? Yeah, and I don't know that everybody either realizes it or remembers it, but Creed and Jacob were roommates mm-hmm. in Army. I mean, they, they they spent a ton of time around each other. But when I would talk to, you know, not even just like the OU commitments that were there, but other reporters or other players, you know, on the two teams, they would tell you all the time, Jacob and Levi were together a lot that week. So, there, you know, I, there's been some talk of, oh, well, maybe he's worried about Levi being there early. And that, there's none of that. Those, those guys want to play together. Jacob's a smart kid. He knows the better the talent is around him, the easier his job will be. You know, he kind of talked about it when he was talking about going over the film with Tim Kish in our interview earlier this week. He was saying, you know, I don't have to do all of these things. I just have to be in this spot. And if I've got good guys, they'll take care of it for me. So, yeah, I, I think it's big. And he he talked about, you know, um, actually, I think the day of that big in home, I guess was Monday, he was FaceTiming with some of the OU commitments, you know, or not OU commitments, uh, the guys that were already on campus, you know, and they're talking about how much fun they're having. And he's like, oh, I'm jealous, man. I wish I could be there, you know, that kind of thing. Again, it, there are guys that say they're committed, but the things they say and the way they say them don't sound right. Everything about Jacob and the way he's doing this just sounds like a guy that knows he's going to OU, but, you know, you, you – it's hard to match that with I'm taking this visit to LSU and my family's paying their way. Like I, I get why the question's there, but when I talk to the guy, that's just not the sense I get. Can you What? Did we just become best friends? Yep. So they really roomed together, huh? I forgot about yeah, that. Yeah, w- which is crazy because I mean like I I mean obviously not crazy, but it's it's very fortuitous for Oklahoma cuz they were the only two OU even you know, related players on that East squad. I mean, they, nobody else in that East squad OU has anything to do with right now. Yeah. So that was clearly planned, but it's a really nice break for OU that he spent all his time around uh, Humphrey. Can you ever remember? A, I, I'm sure that there has been guys that it's it's come down like this. This isn't definitely nothing new to the recruiting game, but uh, can you ever remember a guy that there's been just such two varying opinions on, on where he's going to end up? It seems like, uh, you know, anybody that, uh, covers it from the Oklahoma side, thinks it's Oklahoma, uh, and anybody from the LSU side is just adamant that that they're going to flip him, and it just it seems like the I don't know it, it just something is, seems weird about everything that has gone into uh, I guess this recruitment, and I guess maybe is it just because he's so quiet and he doesn't talk to a lot of people, or I mean, what what's your feel on that? It's definitely unique that it's this strong on either side, and it. <laughs> It makes me wonder, because I think some of that, you know, when you talk about so much of the strength of that information, it's coming from LSU-based people, which leads into the theory that Kerry had last week, where there was a lot of information being fed to kind of make this seem like a bigger deal than it is. Now, don't get me wrong. You go to LSU, you pay your way, you know, your whole family's going. That's not nothing. I don't, you, you can't just say, oh, that that's no big deal. It's clearly an issue. OU is going to be on pins and needles all weekend. I have no doubt about it. But at the same time, I'm talking to Jacob himself. I'm, you know, like it, it, it just, like I said, it reminds me a lot of the Addison Gum situation where everything around him seems to point in another direction, but Addison Gum's never wavered. He never said anything other than I'm going to OU. That's what I'm doing. Whatever. Even during the army week, there were people around him that were kind of sowing the seeds of stuff. You know, oh, he may still be looking around. And he's he's like a week out from enrolling at OU at that point. So, I mean, it just – that's kind of what this feels like is that it's more of what's around Jacob than Jacob himself. And if Jacob is like Addison, he'll just weather that and go with Oklahoma unless something changes. It's hard to believe that people actually listen to that. It has been really weird. I mean – just everything. It's like there's – and look, I don't say – I'm not saying – I'm sure the LSU people are like, oh, there's McQuistion guys just a homer for OU. But it's – it's. I'm guessing those people can't very, talk English. It's been very little information. What information has been out there from Josh has been positive, yet there's this flood of information from the other side, and it's just like, 
I, 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 look, I understand. Signing day is coming up. You got to have everybody wants to have their little bell cow, you know, that rallies the fans and gets everybody excited. the The media wants it. The coaches want it. Uh, the fans like it. It's cool when it happens. And I mean, it would be cool if you know Marvin Wilson really felt like a guy that might choose OU, and he's coming down to signing day. But it doesn't. It doesn't have that same feel. Yeah, I mean, what if Baron Browning says, you know, what, I'm going to go ahead and visit OU one more time, and people on the Oklahoma side, no matter what anybody on the other side would tell them about how it's not going to happen, he's still going to be committed, you're going to be excited in Norman if that five-star defender's coming into town. So uh, to me, Josh, I wonder how how often do you hear that self-fulfilling prophecy from people that it's maybe just wishful thinking about where they, they kind of want to see a kid go um, and not necessarily concrete information. How much of that stuff do you have to deal with when going through a situation like this? Oh, a lot. I mean, and that's really, and, and that's where just experience comes into it, you know, because you get you. There, there are certain people that are very analytical about the way they look at it. Okay, this doesn't add up. This doesn't feel right. You know, th- they can take it. They can read the tea leaves a little better. And then some guys, it's just. Well, it sounds right, and everything looks good, and you know, like, and they're kind of ignoring the the realities. And I think that's the big thing is you just can't you can't trust it to one thing. You can't say, oh, well, you know, like even even Jacob, like he's telling me all the right things, but the guy's going to LSU this weekend. Like you can't just ignore that and act like, well, his word trumps everything else because his actions say something else. So. Uh, that's where it gets interesting. And I, and I do, I think you have to be really careful to kind of try to add it all up. And I, like I said, and you're right, I'm sure people are, you know, LSU folks would write me off in a heartbeat. I'm not saying he won't pick LSU. I don't know that. I don't know what it's going to be like when he sits down with whoever is going to be involved with his final decision. When they sit down at a table and talk about it, I don't know all the people that are going to be in that room. And I don't know exactly how much sway they have over his opinion. But the bottom line is just that right now he seems like an OU guy and it's just going to be about trying to, you know, make sure that nobody in that room, I guess, has more pull in another direction. Josh, so Oklahoma is sitting at 24 commitments right now with Jacob Phillips. You've probably, you've talked about this on the board a lot, I know, but what what are your feelings? What are your thoughts on the numbers coming down the stretch? Does Oklahoma have a backup plan for Phillips? Something we haven't talked about yet. Uh, uh, the Parish Cobb arrest in Waco does that change things? How do you kind of see the numbers shaking out uh, down the stretch here? Well, the Cobb thing is super interesting because you know how does Oklahoma handle that? I mean, it, with the the suspension, he's still a scholarship player, so that's not available to him. But obviously, I mean. If those charges are proven correct, and you know, and he's actually, or, well, he was charged me, with a felony. The accusation, so. if he's actually charged with that, then he's gone. You know, I mean, there's no, there's no way around that. He was charged but, with a felony initially, so I mean, there's always the the chance something like that gets pleaded down. Uh, but if it's a felony charge, oh, oh, you and Bob Stoops football won't have anything to do with it. He'll be out as a student at the university. He was exactly. released on a $90,000 bond. Waco Tribune just put out a new story today or updated story. And, uh, he bonded out at $90,000 this morning. And, uh, Cobb did not address the charges with the Tribune Herald as he left jail on Wednesday morning, only saying, quote, don't assume things. So, uh, somebody stole his car, obviously, and then did all these robberies. I, you know, I talked to some people this morning about it. Um, it, one of the things I was told was that it's not surprising that he, he, he might have been in a situation like that. And I don't – look, like I said, if it's a felony charge, it's it's d- done with. But if he is involved in being the wheel man or whatever he was, uh, you know, robbing people uh, with a gun, you can't keep him on this team. <laughs> You can't. Well, he won't be he won't be allowed to enroll in school if he's look, charged with a felony. I right. said this. I told somebody this early today. Bob Stoops, his staff, been out on the road recruiting. They're they're worried about the 2017 recruiting class. I would think before all these guys went home, as careful as Bob is, and with everything that's gone on, he probably told him, "Look, if you do anything stupid, there might not be a second chance the way things have been going right now." And if you're Parish Cobb. And you're doing this stuff or involved in this kind of stuff, 
I'm sorry, you don't deserve a second chance. OU cannot afford to keep a guy that has been involved in armed you know, robbery. They can't. Especially after they kind of gave him a second chance, didn't they? By by still trying to go after him after the Baylor stuff, after he kind of screwed him over on signing day. I mean, I, I know it's not a second chance legally, but they did kind of give him a new lease on life, I guess, if you will. And he uh, he really kind of kind of effed it up. If you're part of armed robberies, you should be off the team anyway. That being said, you you didn't want to be the first guy in trouble after the Joe Mixon video. I said that in our group conversation and. It, it it wouldn't it wouldn't have mattered if it was Baker Mayfield in an armed robbery. An armed robbery, if you're charged with a felony, you're out of school. But no matter what he did, no matter what anybody did, the first person after Joe Mixon, uh, it was it's going to be bad. It's going to be bad for him. I don't see how he's on this team next year. Well, and I I put up a little story about it. Uh, you know, he wasn't the starter. Jordan Parker was going to be the starter. It would have been great, or would be great to have him. You know, depth wise. But they're so high on Parnell Motley, they never stop, stop saying positive things about him. Uh, we'll see on Justin Broyles, but at least you've got another guy, a corner, that's coming in uh, mid-semester that's going to be able to go through spring practices with yeah. you. I don't know that we're ever going to see anything out of P.J. and Banasaur or Antoine Stevens. Um, I don't think that you could move a Stephen Parker to corner. I know people will probably want to bring that up again and again. But I think with Motley and Broyles and then having two starters... It hurts your depth, obviously, because he can at least play adequately. He came in when Parker got hurt against Oklahoma State and, and did a good job, a decent job. Uh, but at the same time, sorry. I mean, it's it's a bad time to be committing armed robberies at Oklahoma. And getting caught. You don't should, get caught if you're going to do that. Don't right? do it and, oh. and not get caught. Oh, okay. <laughs> Eddie went black mass on us there. Just don't, <laughs> don't let me see you doing what you're doing. Oh, it's not illegal no. unless you get caught. But exactly. exactly. Uh, Josh, back to my original question. So 24 uh, guys committed now with Jacob Phillips. Parrish Cobb's looking like he's not on the team next year. W- what's Oklahoma thinking with their numbers down the stretch, especially you know, linebacker? Do they need a backup for Phillips or corner? Do they need to get another guy for Cobb? What's, 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 the, what's the deal here down the stretch? Coming into the Cobb situation, we'll, we'll kind of go with this from the start and say I think it was clear they wanted two, defensive, two more defensive linemen, I think they would really like those guys to be Austin Fayalu and um, Taquan Graham, who's going to visit on January 27th. I think Fayalu is going to probably announce for Oklahoma this weekend at the Poly Bowl, but then he's going to take a trip to Oregon the following weekend. So that commitment's, you know, kind of kind of a, it's really not anything. I think <laughs> the Poly Bowl started yesterday too. So yeah, yeah. So we'll have to see what happens there. But I mean, that's. That's kind of he'll go up there, and then we'll see what's real on signing day. Is, is what's going to be, because his initial plan when I talked to him on Sunday after his official was, well, I'm going to just wait until signing day and announce. But I kind of heard that the Polynesian Bowl is trying to drum up some interest and some excitement, and they're really, you know, undecided guys. Hey, we want you to make a commitment. So I think he kind of caved to that a little bit. But I, you know, I think everybody knows what that commitment is. It's just kind of a, it's a thing to say right now until he returns. From Why Oregon. would you but, want to go to Oregon and be hospitalized, though? It's true. I mean, look, I, of all the all the years when when people negative recruited against OU for Schmitty and the way that the off season program was, and I mean, even key. I mean, God, anybody remember Dylan Dismuke? I mean, I remember when he committed, his dad came over to me and he said, yeah, he just committed, but he's scared shitless about working out with Schmitty in the weekend. <laughs> and he quit before the summer was even over. Dismuke was the sixth highest ranked offensive tackle Oklahoma has signed in the Rivals era, by the way. And he was scared mm. off of Schmitty. That's crazy. I blame Duncan. Sixth <laughs> highest rated player, but probably the number one softest player. I guess that's uh, that's what that says. Duncan doesn't so, exactly produce. I'm just gonna <laughs> Adam Dorian. No, what, who, they had somebody else that year, right? That like a athlete defensive back that OU Dominic offered. Pettis. Dominic Pettis. That's whatever happened to him. He went JC last I'd heard because he had signed with Arizona and he, you know kind of the same deal that everybody knew. He didn't make grades, so he went JC. And I I want to say it was in Kansas, but I'm not 100 percent about that. And then I I lost track of him. I, I didn't hear anything. Kind of a deal where I think he went for about a semester and watched out. Let's face it. Southwest Oklahoma, unless you're from Lawton, that's your only chance. Altus kids flake out. Who was our boy, Josh? Don't what You know, oh, we all know this is a serious wound for me. Daniel <laughs> Tabin. I'm still not over it. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, he was a serious flame out 
Duncan boys are always serious flameouts. Mm. Lawton boys sometimes make it through. Lawton boys are either I mean like it's a it's it's a legendary flame out or they're in the NFL. Yeah, Jamal so, Brown, Antonio Perkins. Perkins. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hell, Duel I mean, Brewer I mean, was a really good player. Javon so, Harris I mean, was really good. Back. Yeah, Javon Harris. Was it was it Birdine that was from Lawton? Yep. Yes. Yeah. Yep, Lawton Ike. He he might be the that last couple years there where Ike actually produced someone. I mean, I guess – now, take that back. Now, last year they had the receiver that went to North Texas. But, I mean, like the really – the lot and Ike that we – you know, or at least that Kerry and that I, I grew, age up, group with, grew yeah. up on and when they were monsters. Yeah, by the time I was coming through school, lot and Ike was already falling yeah. well behind yeah. the other schools in Lawton. Yeah, it's all lot and Mac, lot and High now. Yep. Yeah. I mean, you know, lot and Ike's literally the state of Oklahoma's last national champion. That's crazy to think really? about. Oh yeah, and uh, what was that ninety one carry ninety something yeah, like half that? Of them, half of half of them were with guys. me at Coffeeville when I was playing baseball. Mm-hmm. They were unbelievable. Was that that was like Will Shields and those guys too? If I think if I'm thinking right, no, that might have been Will a little Shields after Will. was Lawton High, wasn't? Yeah, he? Will Shields Lawton High. You're right. You're right. Yeah, he was uh, before. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, you know. Uh, but to, God, we keep digressing. Yeah, sorry, sidetrack. No, 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 you're fine. So you got the two defensive linemen. Like I said, I think they'd like it to be Graham and Fayalu. If it doesn't work out, I think then you're looking at like Tyrese Lott, who we know is coming in this weekend on an official, uh, the TCU commitment from Ardmore. Uh, I think that he's grown on OU a little bit over time. I, I get the impression that well, and that was always first, the thing, wasn't it? Where I mean, it never seemed like OU, OU really got that big of a chance from him. I mean. They offered, and then he committed to TCU. What was it, like a week later, or was yeah. it even shorter than that? There were some people at Ardmore that I think were a little sore that OU hadn't given him more attention beforehand. And I think there was, I think OU's had some time to kind of, you know, heal those wounds a little bit and, and kind of clear things up a little bit. So I, I, I think that's where that's come from. Then you've got guys like Josh Rogers. Oklahoma would really like to take Corey Bethley from Katy. Uh, from my understanding of things, I don't know that the numbers are going to be there, so that that's kind of the question. The other, I think it's clear they want another corner. Um, I talked to Samuel Barnes kind of first time. I, I haven't had a chance to get on the board with this information yet, but I uh, talked to Samuel Barnes, one of the recent DB offers, who was going to come in this weekend. That has since been canceled, and his re- reasoning to me was someone has committed to Oklahoma and there's no longer a spot for him. That's what That's what he was told by Oklahoma. So there's apparently a silent commitment out there. You would, excuse me, you would have to think it's either Rush Yeast uh, or Trey Norwood, the recent offer from Arkansas. If I'm betting, Trey Norwood would be my guess, but I don't. That that's based on nothing but just reading the tea leaves. I, I don't want that to be Josh is saying. I, I don't know yet. We'll we'll keep looking at it, but that's what adds up to me. And then finally, to kind of finish this whole long elongated question off. Uh, I think they would like another one to be a linebacker. I think they would like it to be Tyler Taylor. Um, that's kind of the backup plan. Also, if they do lose Jacob Phillips, they're hoping Tyler Taylor comes aboard. And, you know, they still kind of have the same numbers they have now. But obviously, if they could get all three of those guys, Draper, Taylor, and Phillips at inside linebacker, obviously that's a huge class for them. So that that's kind of what it's looking like. But if Taylor falls off, then I think you could see them go offensive tackle, maybe really push for Stefan Zabe from Austin Westlake. Uh, you could you could see them maybe go Juco route on offensive tackle, or even still a wide receiver like James Robinson, who I think is very likely to end up at Florida. But Oklahoma, you know, uh, Bob Stoops was in yesterday. I, I think that I still think there is some connection there. By the way, is Florida figure are they ever going to figure out how to offer kids correctly? Like you I don't d- wait two weeks before signing day to start offering kids in Oklahoma. Now, oh, now I missed something. Who did they offer? Or not Oklahoma. Oklahoma. I mean, uh, Oklahoma did Oklahoma's commits. committed. Okay, yeah, Rambo. Charleston Rambo. Yeah, and apparently Florida went by today. So my guess is that they basically said, "Hey, man, we don't want to waste our time. If we offer you, will you set up a visit and we'll come and see you?" And I bet you he was like, "Yeah, sure, I'll set up a visit." And so they set the visit yesterday. They offered, and then they came up today to see him. So, I mean, if that doesn't tell you what this thing is, I mean, it's it's the kid's taking a trip. Like, it, it's not anything to get wound up about. Go where the beach is. is fine. And I think um, he told me actually earlier, 
Bob Stoops, Dennis Simmons, and I believe Lincoln Riley will all be in home with him tonight. I would, uh, yeah, I would advise going somewhere else other than Gainesville. Gainesville is landlocked. Unless you wanted to get like a shit ton of jean shorts while you're out there. (laughs) Maybe get a quick trip to Disneyland or something in Orlando. Gainesville just seems like the worst place you could ever take a visit. Uh, Unless I will say unless this. Tim Tebow was there and he was going to save you. After driving back from the bleep show that is the Russell Athletic Walmart Sweatpants Bowl, by the time you get to Gainesville, you're just so thankful <laughs> that you know you're out of the Orlando. middle of Florida. It's just ugh. Like Gaines, uh, Gainesville seemed like a little bit of an oasis. Florida. Is I was having this conversation with somebody state. earlier, and they they were talking about you know he set that visit thinking like he's going to go sit on a beach somewhere. And he's going to get there and be like, where the shit are the beaches? Like, he's going to realize it's just hellhole, nowhere, Florida. It's like going to Tallahassee. Ex- I mean, yes. Tallahassee's not... It's kind of good right now. Yeah, I mean, yeah. they're really good, but I'm just saying, as a town, like, you think yep. Florida, and you wind yep. up in Tallahassee, you might as well be anywhere in the middle of the United States. Florida is the 50th best state. That's, that's crazy talk. 50th best state. They have the keys. Nah. Nah. No, I, I should say, Eddie, have you spent a lot of time on South Beach? Uh, yeah, and it, it That sucks. feels like a loan that would that would bump it above, like, North you're Dakota. You're just being ridiculous. South you're, Beach You're sucks. trying to have a hot take right now. <laughs> South Beach. You're Skip Baylessing your way through this show right now. Uh, Skip Bayless. You know what? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? He doesn't deserve to be on this earth. Oklahoma boy, he went to uh, high school with my dad at Northwest Classen. They were in the, they worked on the newspaper together. Talk to the hump man about him today, this morning. About Skip? Yeah. If I could go back to any time period, I would go back to, what was it, like mid-70s, probably, early no, 70s? 60s. Yeah, 60s? He, he would have been mid-60s. I'd though. go back to the 60s, and I would beat up Skip Bayless. You could probably do it. Well, you couldn't do it. Skip is kind of ripped. Yeah, but he's like 65. There's a, there's, I could beat the shit out of there's him. There's a difference between being in shape and being in fighting shape. Like, I don't care how you good... You can't go from, I want to wrestle a 93-pound girl to, I could beat the shit out of Kip, Skip Bayless, who lifts every day now. 100%. I'm taking Eddie. You could not. 100%. You, it's it's a fight. Your takes are trash today. Uh, Eddie, well, Skip Bayless well, is a loser. Okay, what are the parameters of this fight? Like, are we talking... Cage. Okay, okay, so there's no running. Okay, that gives Eddie some edge there. Uh, that I if, get him to the ground game, and I uh-huh. just pound. Ground and pound is what it's called. Eddie's, Eddie's got to get him to the ground. That, that That's going to be crucial for that fight. Eddie's good at real sports, not just trying to be the best at exercising. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, you land, a, you land a right hook. It doesn't matter how many sit-ups he did that morning, you know? I, I, More people probably listen to this podcast than watch Skip Bayless's show. It's, it's the fastest-growing sports true. show in television. How, I mean, but to, to be fair, when they say the fastest growing sports show in television, it's a show that didn't exist a few months ago. So, of course, it's the fastest growing sports show in television. That's why that's the biggest lie in television and radio. Like the when they go with literally, if you go from zero to one, you are the fastest yeah. growing. You know, like you've mathematically improved by infinity. We're the like fastest the growing podcast on iTunes. Absolutely. One hundred percent. Well, that's just because we're really good. Yeah. That's a different thing. And that's going to keep up. Don't worry about that. You think you think Shannon Sharp and Skip Bayless are going to be atop the the ratings here in a few months? It's the exact same show, but worse. It's like you ever gotten the candy that looks like the candy, but it's like that off brand or like that's the cereal when you got to walk on the bottom shelf. It's the bottom shelf cereal of a sports show, and I don't even like First Take, but it's still it's still a worse version of First Take. First Take is awful. I can honestly say I've never watched more than probably about ten minutes of of First Take, like a cum- uh, like in a single sitting, like I. I I can't do it. I, I, it's, it's, I don't know. It, I only just, like Max Kellerman when he's interviewing Michael B. Jordan at the end of Creed. I still haven't seen that movie. You haven't seen? Oh, Creed's no, great. No, I need to. Yeah. Creed's really good. Eddie, don't if you rip on Creed, you're out of here. I won't rip on Creed. Boxing is just a stupid sport. <laughs> oh <my> so. God. <laughs> Eddie is just like he is like that. It's he's 100%. like a fire hose right now. He's a fire hose of hot takes. And he has no direction, and it's just it's spewing everywhere. Boxing is there's just nail it down. Boxing is not good. Like it is kind of crazy though. Like my generation of uh, kids, we grew up with no boxing. There was no boxing as opposed to 
uh, people yeah, that are a little bit older. Yeah, killed it by then. Yeah, it was like, it literally was over. I don't, I don't remember. I remember watching uh, the Tyson Holyfield, like the second one. It was just, his ear off. Yeah, it was just because it was like the build up, and it was like, that's the cool thing to do is go that over That really to did help kill boxing, yeah. Watching a guy bite another guy's ear off because he was afraid to fight anymore, that was pretty much killing boxing, yeah. Yeah. Yep. I can remember watching Tyson and Buster Douglas on HBO. Me too. Like I, yeah. I like that was I, that was one of the first big fights I remember. I don't, what are you watching when you watch a boxing match? I guess I just don't get I'm it. I'm just telling you, like I'm older than everyone, but I'm telling you, watching uh, Sugar Ray Leonard and Marvin Hagler and all the I mean, even those middleweight guys fight. They were some of like if you watch like if you watch the thirty thirty on the one. Um, the no moss one he and duran i mean those fights were brutal it was like in today's age they would not let fights like that yeah. exist anymore it was it was like you think mma is brutal that stuff was ridiculous like that stuff was like barely able to stand up and they just kept pounding each other i'm surprised that sugar ray leonard is even alive today after seeing some of the fights he went through as a kid it did i miss the no moss that already that air Yes, yes. Damn it. I missed that. All it's right, really well, good, too. Yeah, right, go find, find it on Netflix. It's pretty good. Cool. All right. Um, you know, team-wise, you know, they have started winter workouts. Uh, somebody's going to have to overtake D.D. Westbrook's 4-3-2 on that board. I was thinking about this today. Like, who would that be? Who is now the fastest man? Trey Brown once he gets to campus. Uh, I think you're right, yeah. It'll be Trey Brown. But he's not there this semester. Um, I I, Broil, I I mean Broyles is not slow by any means. No, I, he was in the ill speed stuff. Yeah, I asked this question last year to a bunch of guys who was the fastest guy on the team, and the answers I got were pretty unanimous. Daniel Brooks, Daniel Brooks, and, Brooks, Dee Westbrook, and Joe Mixon, and all three of those guys aren't going to be on the team next year. So I I think that's a great question. Who, it's not Stephen Parker. Marquise no. Brown is worthy of conversation. That dude can, yeah, fly. can fly. I noticed. Uh, you know, I, this is just twitter creeping but i noticed that chance sylvie tweeted something i think on tuesday just as far as uh said something about marquise brown it looks really good yeah it's basically what the the summary was there but by the way uh the senior bowl rosters came out dd westbrook is not on it yeah you, you want... saw an interesting tweet let me pull it back up uh a little bit disturbing just from a uh, a, a pers- from his perspective of, you know, maybe hurting himself a little bit. Uh, it's from Matt Miller at NFL Draft Scout, who I think does a pretty good job. Yeah, he's a reputable guy. Uh, scouting director told me Dede Westbrook, quote, doesn't want all those questions in Mobile about his background. He's opted out of the Senior Bowl. And, uh, you know, it, it, it just That's kinda, a horrible decision. It kind of goes back to the, to, the, uh, to the thing with Joe Mixon. It's like the two guys... The two big names in this draft for Oklahoma have uh, have gotten some just terrible advice. I feel like, well, just as and far as and he's got the who's his he, he signed he with, signed with uh, Lil, Wayne's Lil Wayne's agent. Yeah, that's right. Not answering. yeah. Let's let a let's let an entertainer tell us how to do PR. A rapper, no doubt. Who guy who's been to jail? Zero percent chance Lil Wayne has any sort of input in that business other than his pocketbook, right? I would have. Oh, absolutely. To think so. I don't know. Yeah. After after hearing Joe Mixon's uh, agent, I'm not sure any uh, of those guys have any sense. <laughs> that was brutal. Uh, here's another uh, little breaking news from Twitter: the uh, D1 Council has already approved the early signing period, so the t- class of 2018 the will December be able signing yeah, in to uh, sign in December. So we'll have I'm two signing days. Start drinking, guys, just in pure <laughs> celebration. The bourbon will be flowing at McQuiston's house tonight. A little Woodford Reserve. Oh, you better believe there's some good stuff going around here. That's uh, yeah, that, that's that's nothing but good news. Why so? Why do you feel like it's good news? I'm just curious. Well, because like you know, you look at guys. You know, even the guys that couldn't enroll early. You know, there's plenty of guys in this class. You know that even if they couldn't enroll early, they would have signed early. Mm-hmm. You know, they could be done with it, and then I don't have to track them, and I don't have to worry about them. So I really know like. I'm trying to think of a good example in this class because this one's a little, this one throws me off a little bit because so many guys did enroll early. 
but you look at a guy like, okay, a perfect example is Zach McKinney from Weatherford, Texas. Like, he can just be signed. We could already be working on the post-signing day stuff for him. You know, like, it just kind of it, it works easier. And, you know, in January, we can be talking about, you know, all oh, the workouts he's already started. OU's got to love stuff like that. And, the, and especially – all the big schools love stuff like that. It's going to hurt some of the smaller schools. There's no question about it. But um, I think that's that's where this thing is nothing but good because you get these kids that they, their phone gets to stop ringing. They don't have to keep dealing with this stuff. Jacob Phillips talked about it, you know, because I'm looking at LSU and OU. Everybody thinks I'm open now. Like I, now he'll still have to deal with that. I mean, obviously, you know, if he's not ready to sign, that doesn't change anything for him. But for the guys that don't want the phone to ring anymore, they get to be done with it, and they can just walk. When you say it hurts the smaller schools, what what schools are there? Are you talking about the like the the North Texases, or are you talking about like Iowa States? I think it's going to be like the the Iowa States, the North, yeah, you know, and maybe not North Texas. But I mean, to me, that's all kind of dog eat dog. Like you, you're just going to have that's going to create a chain effect because. Some kid that doesn't want to sign with Iowa State because he's hearing from Oklahoma, well, he's going to wait, and then oh, I, you know, that kid, then Oklahoma ends up having room for him. Okay, well, then they have to go take the kid from North Texas. Well, North Texas has to go take the kid from Abilene Christian. So it just kind of ends up rolling downhill when all those schools wanted you to do was sign from day one. So that, to me, that's where it's going to be interesting. But I think also it's going to create a lot of clarity because if a kid doesn't sign with you in December and he can – well, what's that tell you? Mm-hmm. I mean, that, that that says something. And if a school doesn't offer you the chance to sign in December when you can, that also tells you something. So I think it's going to create a little bit of honesty down the stretch when these schools are kind of stringing guys out or, uh, or you know, on the flip side, a kid is kind of stringing a school out. Uh, Josh, are you familiar with the story this week out of, uh, I guess it's Connecticut or New Jersey, the Ryan Dickens? I feel like this happens once a year uh, and everybody – just gets been out of shape over it. Uh, but I'm talking about uh, the uh, the kid that was committed to Connecticut. Uh, Randy Etzel and crew took over. I'm 100% behind Randy Etzel on this deal. I, I think I am, too, the more that I think about it. Uh, but the, Ryan Dickens was committed to UConn. Uh, Randy Etzel and staff take over, and they go back to him here this week and say that we don't have a spot for you. Uh where, where, do, where are you on that? And just as far as, I, I, I don't know. I guess I'm kind of in between. Uh, you know what? Have a better offer than Monmouth, okay? That's kind hey. of what I was getting at. That's I my mean, mom's alma mater. Bro, you're 6'2", 210. There's not a lot of, that we can do for you. Sorry that you dominated against a bunch of scrubs back east, but uh, I don't know. Where, where are you on this, Josh? Have you seen it? I haven't, but I mean, it's one of those, like you said, it comes up fairly regularly. So unless there's just some wild deviation of this story, I I don't have a problem with it. I mean, it's not fair, but the reality is, and the, these kids don't understand it, say that Randy, Randy Edsel takes you and he doesn't want you, you're going to spend at least a year there, you're going to waste a year of transfer because they're going to do everything they can to get you off that roster. Whether it's, you know, and I'm not talking about like they're going to be cruel or anything like that, but they're going to make it abundantly clear we, we we don't see you in our future plans. We're, you are not part of what we're trying to do here. Why go we somewhere where you're not wanted? You. Yeah. Why go somewhere where you're not wanted? Exactly. Like, you, you, and the kids get in their head that well, only a D one matters. Man, bull crap. If if some other school wants to play pay for you to play ball, go there and play ball where they actually want you. The problem was he didn't to have UConn just because it's a name and you prob- get to feel good in front of your buddies. And the problem he had was he didn't have any other D one offers. Yeah. So why should Randy Edsel have a gun to his head saying you have to take this kid because the staff that was terrible before <laughs> you offered him a scholarship, offered him a scholarship yeah. and was going to continue being terrible. You don't have to be chained to that fence. I mean, you should be able to have a clean slate. Yeah, I'm sorry. And the thing about these stories that I always hate is it's always from the player's perspective because mm-hmm. the coaching staff can't talk about it. They can't 
that it's an NCAA violation if they even broach the subject of a kid that hasn't signed with them. So you always get this woe is me story. And usually how it works out is the kid did know. He had several hints. The coaching staff had dropped communication with him almost completely. Mm-hmm. He hadn't heard from him. So his dad or his coach, whoever called up and said, does this kid still have a scholarship? When he hasn't heard, I guarantee you, Randy Edsel probably never called this kid and he probably had to call Randy Edsel or someone at the UConn and say, hey, do I still have a scholarship here? And they probably said, Let's ch- let us check into it. We'll get back to you. Two things. I bet his dad's a helicopter dad, if I had to guess. Sure, yeah. Two, it's never good when they when they're listing like the 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 all the things about this kid. And the second thing that comes up is, well, he's devoted to community service. Yeah. No stats, nothing about football playing, but he he did do some good community service. Because you joined the Peace Corps doesn't mean that I have to put you on my football team. Yeah, exactly. I don't think I want you on my football team if you're in the Peace Corps. Stuff like this is also why guys tend to stick with their position coaches or whoever recruited them because they know if you're their guy, once they get there, you're going to make more of an effort to make sure that you stay there and succeed. When you're not somebody's guy or not their person, then chances are they're not going to make an effort to keep you around. So that's kind of why when coaches leave and when a position coach leaves and guys say, oh, you should just commit to the school, that's also kind of an extra variable there that kids are going through in that situation. Well, guys, oh, you had one of these last year with Eric Swenson, you know, the, yeah, the kid yeah. that was committed to Michigan for so long. And, you know, I, we, we kind of, you know, there was a lot of stories on rivals. I know Josh Hemholt wrote some of them. And it was kind of that same deal, like, oh, we just kind of got left to the lurch. We didn't know. When I talked to people that kind of had some insight on that, that's not the case. I mean, the, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying Jim Harbaugh came and said, hey, we don't have a spot for you. But they were clearly separating themselves from Eric Swenson. I mean, there's no question that was happening. Now, if you feel that's right or wrong, that's up to you. But these things happen even at the major schools. I mean, this happens all the time. And instead of Eric Swenson signing with Michigan, which had kind of lost faith in him or wasn't interested or ran out of numbers, whatever you want to say it was, he gets to go to OU that's pretty excited about him. And can think, you know, hey, maybe down the road when Orlando Brown's gone and there's some space, maybe there's a spot for you to start. By the way, am I crazy or did OU also do that to a kid that Norvell recruited? Was it the Hardy kid that ended up at Louisiana Tech? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Adrian Hardy last year. Yeah. That's another good one. Yeah. Well, I mean, you have a a staff changeover. You had a kid that had been recruiting two years prior, was kind of an evaluated kid. And basically, he was told. We don't have a spot for you. You need to look somewhere else. I mean, so OU has done it. Mm-hmm. I mean, everybody kind of does it. But, well, I mean, the kid look, landed at Louisiana Tech. He didn't land at Monmouth. Sorry, Joe. Guys, we may I mean. not be the guys on Twitter publicly, you know, shoving PJ and Bonasaur down everybody's throat as, as the answer to corner in the midseason. But it doesn't change. I mean, we've all heard that smoke that maybe if PJ and Bonasaur wanted to look around, nobody's going to be that heartbroken about it. Yeah, just I mean that 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 stuff happens. It's it's just part of this day and age of college football, and I don't understand why these kids could hear, you know, you're not really part of our plans, or we don't really think you're going to help us win here. Why would you want to be there? Like, if you have any competitive nature, go somewhere where you're going to play, and they want you. Yeah, to from again, I know. Kerry doesn't love this, but from the kid's perspective, that should give you extra incentive to keep in touch with other schools, even if you are committed, because you never know what's going to happen, and you don't want to be left in the dark all of a sudden if there is a coaching change at the place you're committed, or they just decide that they don't want you anymore. So I I guess my point is if if the coaches are going to play that game, then people shouldn't be mad if the kids play other games too. I I think sometimes there can be a double standard that way where kids want people want to judge a kid if he's looking around or um, trying to make a good best decision for him, and they don't judge coaches for doing the same thing. That's a great point, Joe. I mean, and that's why when the, you know, it's, and you know how that stuff is. Like, people get mad about Jacob Phillips. Oh, he made a commitment. He's looking around. Well, did it, did it bother you when Austin Falow was committed to Arizona and set up an official to you? Hell no, it didn't. Mm-hmm. Like, don't, don't act high and mighty. It, it, you use it to when it works to your advantage. Yep. So th- th- there's, there's nothing wrong with that. Kids are going to look around. You know, I was talking. I can literally tell you, I was having a conversation about that, and I'll do this real quick because I know we want to move on to something else. Uh, I was talking to somebody about Jacob Phillips' situation. I was talking to a family member of one of the early enrollees, 
And they were like, yeah, we, we kept in touch with a few schools. We didn't go anywhere. We didn't take any visits. But say OU gets hit with a death penalty tomorrow, we need to have somewhere we can go and land safely. Like, we don't want to go to, you know, they don't want to walk into what Baylor is right now. They wanted to go somewhere great, and they had the chance to, so they stayed in contact with a few schools and just left that door open. And that's, that's I don't see how anybody, when they if it was your kid and you were looking out for their best interest, you would do the same if you're thinking about things logically. God, I would have handled my recruitment. If I was privileged enough, oh. I would have I would have been a terror on the recruiting trail. We're, we were talking about this earlier with the Florida thing in Rambo. If you get to choose one place, like, oh, I'm just visiting there because I want to take the visit, where are you going? There's, it's, it's not even a question. Arizona State, sign me up. Let's go to Mill Street. That's a good place. I mean, they're, they're really – I can't think of it's another – UCLA. It's a talented campus. Uh, I think Columbus would be pretty fun if it was like Asian girls Ohio everywhere. State, UCLA. Michigan weekend. There you go. UCLA wouldn't quote. be bad. Uh, I'm trying to think of other places now. Yeah, all Jacob Phillips is going to get is. Oh, I'm so shrimp rich. I mean, <laughs> and lots of corn dogs. <laughs> shrimp. <laughs> it's going to be shrimp rich. And you can't. I, I, I don't think you can do Hawaii officials anymore. I think you have. They have to know for sure that you're. There's a complicated system of yeah, you, pulleys and levers. You can't just say I'm visiting USC, Alabama, LSU, Oklahoma, and Hawaii, and take that trip. I don't you think, think once you get down to Baton Rouge, they like take you in a room. They're like, "This is Ryan Paralu. He can fit you with a fake ID this weekend." Speaking of Lil Wayne, yeah. I did hear. I did hear <laughs> that Paralu. He wants. Isn't that who that did that? Yeah. Wasn't he running a <laughs> yes. uh, fake license? Lil Wayne has said that uh, he's ruined a few LSU players' career too with the partying in New Orleans. Speaking of Lil Wayne, I think Jamarcus Russell was one he talked about once of how he ruined himself. Well, sure, but I think Lil Wayne was uh, there to help. If you run yourself on a uh, official visit, you're just not made for the college life, in my opinion. Well, somebody tell that to Willie Williams. What happened to him? He was the guy that went to uh, to a trip to Miami. Or was it Miami, Josh, or was it USC? And set off the fire uh, extinguishers in the hotel? He went, let's see. He, Willie, for those that don't remember, Willie was, he was in Adrian Peterson's class and was just this five-star linebacker elite guy. But he had, he, he chronicled his visits with the, uh, was it the Miami Herald, I think? And had gone like each visit, he was writing like a, a story <laughs> along with a writer about each of his trips. And like one, he he ordered like forty pounds of crab on some on some visit or something. Like he just was these crazy off the wall things. I'm trying to remember, Carrie. I know what you're talking about. And I don't know which school it was. It might have been University of Florida. Along. It could because he and it might have been it, he might have been on that I mean, official visit with Lewis Baker. Oh God. If he was with Lewis, I bet it was pretty popping. I think Lewis was after that. I might be making that up. Cause Lewis, yeah, Lewis was 06, maybe 07. Yeah, he, he was in school when I was in school, I yeah. think, at least yeah. a little bit. And he, he likes Peter's, to have fun. He had some fun hair, I'll tell you that. That's legendary Oklahoma football hair, Lewis Baker. Right up there with uh, Billy Sims. I don't, what are, there aren't any other great hairdos in OU history. Uh, Jonathan yeah. Alvarez had great hair Dusty last year. Dusty the Borchek yeah. had some pretty yeah, good yeah. hair. Dusty, yeah. uh, Bear, Jordan Wade had some solid hair last year. Got to dig the fro. All right, uh, before we get out of here, I wanted, we already kind of touched on it a little bit. We talked about uh, Marquise uh, uh, Brown coming in and, and being a speedster, but uh, let's just talk about the guys that, that came in. I mean, Levi Draper, Addison Gums. I, I think, you know, linebacker, obviously a – Hey, should we just, as long as the Jacob Phillips thing works out, you know, Tim Kish, yep. nicely done. done. You've done well. If he leaves, yeah. if he all leaves, hell breaks It's loose. all, you're fired. Uh, but, I mean, this class in general, I think, one, it's going to be huge for the linebacker position, just having more guys in the spring. Obviously, the running back position needs some guys. We don't know Rodney Anderson exactly how much he's going to do this spring. I think he's going to be fine to go full go. Uh, he hasn't had a neck brace on in forever. Uh, but, you know, Kenneth Murray, we didn't even mention mm -hmm. him, adding him in linebackers. You're going to have another quarterback in there in Chris Robinson. But, uh, Josh, just your kind of thoughts. Let's start with the, the running backs with, with Sutton and Sermon and kind of what they can add to OU right away, especially being a Juco guy in Sutton. Well, Sutton's really 
one of those guys that as soon as he committed, there was a lot of talk of he's an athlete, not a running back. And I think that, yeah, I think some of that was recruiting pitch and kind of how they were presenting that to guys like Trey Sermon and Kennedy Brooks. But at the same time, I do think, you know, Oklahoma's going to use him in the return game. Wouldn't shock me at all if they use him in the slot. I mean, this isn't, you know, we talked last week about how different the Sugar Bowl would have looked um, with Josh Heupel at the helm instead of Lincoln Riley. To me, this is kind of like what Roy Finch would have looked like under Lincoln Riley instead of Mm -hmm. what he looked like under Josh Heupel. Like, it just... I, Sutton is not a superstar. I don't think he's going to be a guy that you build your offense around. But you can do a lot of different stuff with him, and I think that's what you're going to see with Lincoln Riley is they're going to get creative with him, put him in space, create some you know bubble screens. He's going to do probably some jet sweeps, stuff like that where they get him in space and let him make plays. And I think that's where he's really going to be the most ideal. Trey Sermon, big, strong guy. I mean, of, of all the three running backs, he's the one – that could walk in and probably handle 20 carries right from the start because he's just that kind of guy and has played in Georgia. I mean, he's played against a very high level of high school athletes. So I think Sermon is, of any of the three, the most likely to get a lot of carries this year. I don't think any of them probably will just because of you know guys like Rodney Anderson and Abdul Adams returning. But I think Sermon's a good player, very similar to Joe Mixon in his skill set. I'm not telling you he's that level of athlete, But in what he does well, you know, he's a very good receiver, a very sturdy guy, like I said, going to run between the tackles and not have problems. So I I think that's that's where you see uh, the strengths of his game. But I think both guys, if for nothing else, just taking some of the load off those older backs this year and letting them maybe get a little rest through the spring. Maybe Gum's the guy that has kind of gotten overlooked a little bit. He was so good in the U.S. Army game. Uh, but maybe the guy that's been overlooking is a possible potential, you know, instant impact guy next year. I think if it wasn't for the fact that Oklahoma looks really locked in an outside linebacker, Kelly then, yeah, Obo. I think you're right. I mean, with with Caleb Kelly and Oboe coming back, I mean, how many snaps are there really available there? But if you talk about a combo between Kelly and Gums for you know the next at least next two years, and even maybe next three years. You're, you're talking about two really elite edge rushers that could, you know, really, when you think about what a 3-4 outside linebacker looks like, they look like those guys. But I'll say this, so I, I, Kelly, I mean, Kelly admitted it to me in the Sugar Bowl, like, he's not as good a pass rusher as he was in high school right now, and that's something he really has to work on. You look at this defensive line, you've got Oboe, who I think should be under consideration for, for Big 12 Defensive Preseason Player of the Year next year became an even better pass rusher as the season went along. But tell me who else they have that, that worries you as an offense, as a edge rusher. I think there's room for a guy that if he can be if he has that natural uh you know pass rush ability that he could get into the lineup more next year. You're you're not buying Kenneth Mann and Gabriel Campbell? You you're you're not in on that? No, no. <laughs> no. You're gonna I, get Eddie I, to say something awful here again. I know. I, I think you're right. I mean, now, like I said, I like Mark Jackson, too. I think I've always been pretty yeah, open about so that. Yeah, he's so raw. I mean, I mean he, there, he there's a, a role to make for a Gums if he can take it. he just got to show he's ready to do it. Yeah, I think Oklahoma's shown that if if you can bring something that they don't have already on the field, they'll put you on the field. So if Addison Gums shows up and, and practices, they just can't keep him off the quarterback. They'll find a way to get him on the field. I can see that. But if he's if he's – about the same or right in the same neighborhood of, of effectiveness as someone like Mark Jackson, like that, the, the, they'll probably redshirt him. But I think if Gums is that guy, if he's that dude, they'll put him on the field. I don't, I don't think there's any question about that. I mean, they, I'll be shocked if he's not one of those guys that comes out the first couple of weeks and then you know either proves he needs to be out there more or suddenly comes up with an ankle sprain and has a medical redshirt. Uh, Grant Calcaterra, I mean. They have a position that he plays. They have a guy that's all Big 12 first team, but a guy that's had some injury issues. Um, do you see instant red shirt for him? Or do you see a guy that might be able to, to, to contribute, considering that they don't really have a lot of playmakers returning on offense at the receiver? That's uh, the reason that I think he could play is because you just look at, I mean, who do you count on in the skill positions right now? I mean, who do you feel really good about aside from Baker Mayfield? I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, Nick Basquine's a fine player, you know. I mean, there's some guys that can make, you know, can do what is asked of them. 
But are there guys there that are going to make plays and do things that are beyond what was created? I, I don't know that you see a lot of that. So I think Calcaterra is a guy that, I mean, you know, you go back and watch his tape. This is a guy that's jumping over people, has some of the best hands in the entire country in 2017. Grant Calcaterra catches everything. And when you look at, you know, and, and as much as I think of Mark Andrews as an athlete, I think we all know he's had a problem with drops. I mean, I think that's just inevitable. So to have that steadying force there, a guy that you know that you can go to and he's going to catch the ball and he's going to do the things he needs to, but he's also 6'3", 220 and can run, that that provides some, mitch, uh, excuse me, some mismatches that I think are going to be interesting to watch. Josh, do you think that OU has more receiving yards next year from guys that were on the team last year or guys that weren't on the team last year? Oh, that's pretty good. Because uh, – I'll go with more guys on the team, but I'll tell you right now, if you were going to make me bet of if one of the incoming receivers was the leading yardage guy, I would take that bet. I would bet you either Brown or maybe even Sedarian Lamb just blows up and they can't keep him off the field. Yeah, I, to me, I, Meade has you know, 500, 600 yards, five touchdowns or something. But after that, mm-hmm. you're looking at, I think, Sedarian Lamb and Marquise Brown. I think you hit the nail on the head. I think those may be OU's two leading receivers next year. And they're two guys that Baker Mayfield wasn't even throwing to at all last year. The, 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 the explosion that Lamb and Brown both have is absurd. And to get Brown already on campus as a JUCO guy, I, I would be shocked I, if he wasn't uh, – one of Baker Mayfield's top options or the number one guy before it's all said and done. Marquise Brown, the last, uh, is he the first guy? I know he's he's from California, Juco, but last uh, hometown Hollywood, Florida guy since Davin Joseph at OU, I think? I think that's right. I mean, he, and even if you just go into South Florida, I mean, that that list goes back a little ways. It's It's been a while since Oklahoma's made any real dent there. Um because, I mean, and, and that's no fault of OU. That's a really tough place to recruit, uh, especially to Norman, Oklahoma. That, that's just such a cultural difference. By the but, Hollywood floor, yeah, you're right. It might as well be in Miami. When you drive from Miami to Fort Lauderdale, right in the middle is Hollywood, Florida. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they have Amon Thomas on the team now. It's from Miami. But, I, but Torrance Marshall's a Miami guy, right? That was uh, Yes. That, that was like a homecoming game for him, that Orange Bowl. I have to ask Carrie and Eddie a question. Did Michael Jones come up at all in Sugar Bowl stuff? Like, did that name get buzzed around at all? I didn't hear it. Not no. really, but like, you know, we, we addressed this on the board a little bit. It was such a bizarre bowl prep because everything got shut down because of the Joe Mixon video coming out. I don't remember ever having an opportunity. We never talked to Lincoln Riley. Uh, throughout the bowl process, except no. the very beginning, and that was right as they were starting practices. So we never really had an opportunity to to have Lincoln Riley uh, address young guys or Mike Stoops address young guys. I'm not saying that he he didn't do well. I'll say this: just judging from Twitter, you can tell it was just his birthday. Like players yeah. love Michael Jones. That's why he's was a just really popular say, guy. Like if you check the Twitter, you know the 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 regular off season BS stuff from players it's everybody's the you're the next man up kind of thing yeah with uh, Michael Jones so Joe era eight is that when he yeah, yeah something like that Michael Jones and uh, Abdul Adams are interesting to me because those are both guys that I think we all thought and that a lot of people thought were very explosive athletes coming out of high school um, and you know there there are people that kind of criticize Adams even though he averaged over five yards a carry that he didn't have enough explosive runs. Jones, I think, only averaged like six yards a catch or something like that. Are those two guys that are going to have a jump up next year? Or are those two guys that we've seen uh, that we might have overvalued what they had? <laughs> well, they better, or they're, they're going to they're be in trouble <laughs> offensively if they can't get anything out of two of those two guys. Yeah. No, I don't think there's any overvaluing. I mean, the thing about Abdul Adams that surprised me is, you know, when you're watching Samaj P. Ryan and Joe Mixon, those are two of the most physically imposing backs you're going to see, and then mix it to add the athleticism and the speed that he has. Like, Abdul Adams, I think he's a really good running back. He's just not either one of those guys. He's not as big as Samaje, and he doesn't... Like, even Samaje had better top-end speed than Abdul Adams has. Yeah, he got caught from behind a couple times. Which is shocking to and me. And the most shocking one was probably up in eight. Iowa State, yeah. yeah. I was shocked at that one. Uh, I'll but say he this. was banged up, though. I think, I think you do have to... Uh, add and he that was, in with let's him. face it, Samaje and Joe weren't taking any carries in practice. It was poor Abdul Adams and 
Devin Montgomery and all those guys taking a beating in yeah. practice every day. So they weren't probably ever 100%. So, yeah, I'll, I'll look forward to seeing what it's like when he's kind of allowed to be the guy and rest and stuff like that. Last thing I want to hit on before we go, um, really, I mean, I think it'd be, it, it would be great for him to get the reps anyway, but now for the football team, for practice's sake, having a guy like Justin Broyles being a mid-semester guy with what's going on with Parrish Cobb, that's probably the biggest blessing in disguise for this class. Eddie, yeah, Joe. Very much. Very much so. I, I think that uh, it's just insane that when you look at the guys that they got on campus uh, on two, on Monday, Tuesday, uh, I mean, you're talking about nearly half of the class right now is already on campus. Uh, I think that, you know, if there's anybody that, that recognizes the situation around them, it's probably going to be Justin Broyles. Uh, you know, I, I think that uh, – you know, you obviously he he probably would never come out and say that he he's happy that this has happened, but I'll say it for him. I bet I would have to think that he is a little happy that that maybe a spot is opening up, and I think that uh, it kind of just even reinforces the idea that uh, it was a good idea to uh, to graduate early and get down to Norman, where he can he can go now go through spring and one once summer workouts come, he's not going through it for the first time. So I think that. Uh, it's all uh, it's all good for uh, for Justin Broyles right now. And the thing about Justin is, uh, you're in this in, in college football, your talent, your athleticism, your build, your build. That's only half the battle. Once you get there, you got to put in the work, especially at a place like Oklahoma that values it. That you're not going to be on the field unless they see you putting in the work every day. And Justin's a guy that once he gets there, he's going to be in the indoor or working out or playing football every chance he gets. And he's someone that. You mentioned Michael Jones, the team loves. He's someone that the team is going to love, and I think we've already seen that already on Twitter the short time he's been there. Guys on the team responding really well to Justin. So I, I think that's an environment that he can really thrive in. He's been familiar with that team. He's been familiar with those coaches. And I, I just think I think he – if Justin Broyles doesn't succeed at Oklahoma, it won't be for lack of effort. I'll put it that way. Maybe one, one of the other things I want to touch on with this incoming you know, mid-semester class – it's kind of ironic because you could sit and say, okay, so, oh, you had this thing where for so long they've had the center position that's been undersized, you know, Gabe Eichert, tight end, got bigger. Gabe's still in the NFL, I know. I don't want to hear it, Gabe, if you're listening to this. <laughs> uh, one of the few guys, I mean, like, Ty, he mentioned this to me the other day. Was it, was it Tyro Nix? Was that the defensive tackle badass at Notre Dame? No, uh, not Tyrone Nix. Not uh, Tyrone Nix was the, the, uh, coach the coach for all uh, the uh, uh, Nix. Something he wore a single Lewis Nix. Lewis Nix. Lewis Nix the yep. third. Yeah. Like I get so much crap from Gabe Eich Eichard because when he was a junior and Notre Dame came here, I made a big deal about how he got tossed all over the field that day. And uh, then the next year when they went to Notre Dame, it was like he played the game of his life and just dominated Nix mm -hmm. all over the field. He reminds me all the time that he's still in the NFL and Nix is not. So, but he was I undersized. Nix was a monster. I love so that. He was. Re I'm surprised that he didn't Nick's make it. In the eat NFL. himself out of the league. I was in the field for that Norman game for Notre Dame, and he did eat Gabe up up and down the field. I mean, he was Woo! a monster. Gabe, sorry, Gabe. You are still in the NFL. Cut and check. I didn't. You, I didn't see that. You went I didn't at see that Joe happen. Duvall, yeah. Gabe at Joe Duvall. I'm glad you guys are awesome. You know about this because I'm going to see him in a week face to face. So. <laughs> I never saw. I never thought that. And we'll, we'll be drinking hey, it probably. To be fair so. to Gabe, he can get tested for the juice, and you can't, buddy. So you just keep pumping that iron. Uh, yeah, I'm retired from the NFL too. I retired from Major League <laughs> Baseball last week. I'm retiring from the NFL this week. Uh, but no, the point I'm trying to make is you bring in Creed Humphrey, two ninety. Uh, you've got Jonathan Jonathan Alvarez, who's a big guy. To me, what's ironic is Eric Wren is the, now the smallest guy on the line. And he's what two ninety probably, probably just a hair under three hundred. Maybe he is three hundred, but he doesn't look that much different than the media that's around him when he's in there. Yeah, he's not a he's not a physically imposing guy. But uh, Logan Robertson, I mean, he's a big kid coming in. You're basically what Bill Beatonbow. He's stockpiling a bunch of really big centers, which has to make OU fans happy after the Ty Darlington years and the you know gay biker. I, I know. I will say this. I heard from uh, someone in that team that said uh, that they think Creed Humphrey should be starting next year. And I know it's way early and he's just there, but I think that says a lot about the physicality and his presence he brings. And you guys have been around Creed. He's a really big guy, but that's some solid mass. That's not a guy with flab. 
he's a big, strong kid. So it, it doesn't shock me that once he showed up, people were like, oh, okay, let's, let's make him the center, especially considering what you know the size they've had there the last few years. And that would make more sense than, I don't know, maybe not make more sense, but Josh, tell me if I'm wrong here, but Creed has more natural gifts to him than Logan Robertson. He, he's someone, if, if you're Oklahoma, you want Creed to work out more so than Logan, if that makes sense. Am I, am I off there, Josh? No, I, I think you're right. He he's more athletic than Logan is. Logan's a bigger framed guy, a bigger dude all around. But Creed's more natural. He's gonna pull like Creed is so big, but he can still do some of the things like we're talking about, like Gabe Eichert. I mean, Gabe Eichert is like people don't pull centers all that often, and he pulled all the time at OU because he was so athletic, he could do it. And I I think when you see you know Creed can do some of that same stuff. And I, I think that's that's what you like about him. But he's still – he's going to get to college and be 315 before he knows what happened. Like, I mean, he's a big, yeah. big kid. Now, some, we have to cover the elephant in the room if we're going to talk about Creed Humphrey. The board talks about it all the time. I don't know if the four of us have had this conversation. Guys, the – Kerry Murdoch, Creed Humphrey relative conversation. Where are we at it. on this? I don't see it. Uh, my dad has brought it up before, and I don't know. I, I, I guess I can see it. It might be a little bit of a stretch, though. It's I, I think, you know, <sighs> I see it a little bit, but I, I also Good. think Kerry's handsomeness doesn't always come across over the radio. You know, you, you've got to see him in person to really appreciate it. I, I, to pull this up. I feel like we're getting dangerously into do all big white guys look the same? Oh. I mean, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I can see what, what, where it's coming from. I'm going to hold on. Believe it or not, people I'm won't, pulling up freshman year Kerry Murdoch pe- photo. People won't believe <laughs> people won't believe this that deal with Kerry on Twitter and on the board stuff, but uh, he's got it. Kerry's very engaging. He's got a great engaging personality. And uh uh, Creed, I love Creed, but he's much more kind of a country boy, subdued, and so that's maybe where I'm not seeing the, the connection. All right, jo- of got- course, Joe wants to connect on a spiritual level. Of course, Joe wants a raise. It sounds like to me. <laughs> <laughs> while, we're, right. while we're killing time, I this is a thought that I wanted to bring up. There's freshman Kerry Murdoch. Holy cow! That didn't even look like you. And that's freshman Creed Humphrey. There's no comparison. You were no comparison. I can confirm. You were an in shape ball player. Yeah. Look at the. They got veins in the arms and stuff. That was during your first cycle with steroids. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I think that was my sophomore year. Maybe. Is that in Coffeeville? Yes. Guys, the wood we, we bat. Did, we use helmets. Carries. Did you play we when they had steroids last <laughs> they, week? Oh, I keep it ass. <laughs> of course, man. God, you're a jackass. <laughs> All right. Let's go ahead, Josh. Let's ruin this podcast in style. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's what I'm going to do here. Okay. There's me and my wrestling we, singlet. Oh, there. Oh, I'm, and that, a bowl. Oh, man. And a bowl cut. The oh, there's a bowl <laughs> cut. It was like a eight is enough cut right there. <laughs> See, that's something Eddie and Joe can be glad they, that was not part of their world. Like, the bowl cut literally could have been cut with a bowl. Like, that was one of the few cuts that fit its name. Like, it, those were so bad, and they were so cool for a while, and I don't know why. I had one. We all had one. Yeah, it looks, but, looks way too much like Lloyd Christmas from Dumb and Dumber. Yeah. I, I went with the yeah. – I just went with the buzz cut to me. That always made sense as a kid. I didn't have to deal with just, you know, done. All right. The uh, got always itched. I hated them. Any, uh, anything else recruiting-wise you want to throw out there before we get out of here? Because we've got to get out of here. I, I didn't have anything recruiting-wise, but I did want to say, when we were talking about Parrish Cobb, I imagine the hardest person in Waco would be the softest person in South Dallas. Don't you think? Yeah. That's probably why they overcompensate. Yeah. With that's their why criminal activity. I just... I'm having a real tough time dealing with this because I just... I don't see the to reason to be hard in Waco. We need to get him to Falls Creek. Baptists aren't doing their job, obviously. Oh. <laughs> Eddie, I mean, like, I'll go, you know, I mean, you do it too. You go to these schools, you know, out in these towns, you'll see these kids, and, you know, you can tell they think they're bad. And I'm like, dude, I've rolled through some schools that would eat you alive and spit you out. Like, don't, don't even, like, you, you're not impressing anybody here. What was the school that I met you at? Oh, Sharpstown, man. Sharpstown. 
that, that's town. always a good example. That um, was uh, that was that was now rough. South Dallas will wake you up. I mean, it, it you'll get woke. Yeah, a little I'll, bit. I'll tell you where you don't play South Oak Cliff. Don't play around at South, South no. Oak Cliff, man. That's a, that's a real place. Well, even like that's I mean, even hood. like you can go to a beautiful stadium like South Grand Prairie, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. then you start driving out of there, and you're like, oh my god, it's a war zone. It's like Brett Bomer lived here. Yeah, like, where did he live? In the press box of the football stadium, <laughs> yeah, they just they had a they had a uh, condo up there. Norman North was pretty tough. We had a lot of uh, we we had the uh, <laughs> you had a lot of coke dealers. Well, we had tons of drug dealers. If you want to talk drug dealers per capita, Norman North's up there. It's just a different brand of drug. Mm-hmm. I, th- I would bet you that's a lot like the Edmond schools. Dated a girl, Edmond girl in college. That's uh, yeah, th- there's a fair bit of that going on Edmond as well. We could talk a f- entire podcast about this, about how hard our respective, yeah. I obviously grew up in the the toughest area, PC North. (laughs) I bet, I bet, I bet you guys, you guys were probably like the outsiders. You were like the the socias, and the PCO was like the (laughs) greasers. Kind of go try and start a rumble on the weekends, going to the drive-in. Yeah, you passed Northwest Expressway. You passed. Don't mess with Sammy B and the boys. People knew. People knew. Eddie and I have talked about this. Like North and Original. There was a lot more communication west. We were like kind of out there on our own. Like it wasn't it's like I didn't we had know no a lot of original you. people. I didn't know a lot of north people, and I think they felt the same about us. Yeah, we just had no respect for people from west. Well, you know, hey, you know, stuff comes around. You know, state champions, PC, whatever. It's Let's like the Hufflepuff. Hang up on this stuff. PC West mm-hmm. is the Hufflepuff of mm-hmm. PC schools. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh God, I haven't been back. I don't speak, I don't speak nerd and have it. I have no <laughs> idea what that means. Is that a is that a Harry Potter thing? Oh, yeah, come on, is. is it? Yeah, gee, many Christmas. How many lockers? Joe, were you, you act in? like you're normal. <laughs> <laughs> I am normal in my own mind. At least three that's, dozen. That's grammar from inside of a locker, is what that is. <laughs> you couldn't you fit me in a locker. Like a Harry Potter chick flick marathon, like Save the Last Dance, followed by Harry Potter or something. We'll watch all the Harry Potter movies during a Christmas time. It's a great time of year to do a Harry Potter <laughs> marathon. <laughs> I'm so glad that what I missed the entire... What type of incense do you burn during your Harry Potter marathon? <laughs> I never look at it. I just kind of go by the color. <laughs> Sandalwood? There's like the white color looks good. I always like that one. The white color looks it good. It smells clean. That one's like linen, I think. God. That'll kill the podcast. Well, All that's, right. That's how our podcast goes. It just It's like going down a drain. and We've reached that point where it's... We like, have. We're, the, we, yeah, we're... We're down there with the hair now. Uh, all right, that's going to do it for another day. My voice is leaving us. Uh, another unofficial 40. Uh, Got to go watch this godforsaken Thunder team tonight uh, at 930. Get their asses beat by Golden State. By the way, Clay Thompson, I think, is out tonight. If you're listening to this podcast tomorrow, I'm sorry. Uh, More points for Kevin Durant. That's, that's that going to do it. I hope uh, he tears his knee up. Josh McQuistian. <laughs> Eddie Radosovich with the fire hose takes today. Uh, Joe Duvall. From the locker. To you, yeah, we're going to stuff you in one after this is over. Uh, I am Kerry Murdoch, and we'll see you guys next time on the Unofficial 40.